The solo rules for Moria expands on the existing rules from Strider Mode. Now, instead of just controlling a lone hero, you will also get to play as a band of heroes. You will still have your primary character that you will create using the rules from the One Ring core book, with a few changes. Instead of starting with 10 experience points to spend, you will have 15. And instead of picking an individual calling for your main hero, you will choose a new calling that is shared by your band. The shared callings include a disposition focus for your band, which I'll cover soon, favorite skills to choose from for your player, and shadow paths that are the same as in the core rules. The Moria book also assumes that you are playing through Balan's expedition to reclaim Kaza Doom, so the fellowship rating is set at 3, plus 1 for having Balan as your patron. This of course could change if you have a different patron. The last change is that you and your band share hope and shadow, so raise your character's max hope by 5 points. Let's move away from our main hero and onto our band. Starting off, your band can have a maximum of 6 allies. Throughout play you will likely gain and lose some of them. Your band is mainly defined by its readiness attribute, which begins at 4. This is a general score to note how capable your band is. This number will also give you your readiness TN, which is equal to 20 minus the current value, which will give us 16. Instead of skills, your band has 5 dispositions for expertise, maneuver, rally, vigilance, and war. Anytime your band needs to make a disposition check, roll a d12 and a number of d6s equal to the specific disposition rating. These dice will be rolled against your band's readiness TN. The default value of each disposition is 2, however this will get modified when you prepare for your mission. With the shared callings we looked at earlier, I mentioned a disposition focus. For my band, I've decided to choose the Vanguard calling, which gives my band a disposition focus on war, and acts similarly to a distinctive feature. Anytime I'm making a roll for war, my band is inspired, which means that if I spend hope on the roll, I gain 2d instead of just 1. Now that the broad view of our band is ready, let's find out who the individual members are. I will walk through the creation of one ally to show you how it works. Starting out, there are only three things each ally will need. A name, a gift, and a quirk. There are lists for each of these, but you can of course make up your own as well. Names and quirks have no mechanical benefit, but help to differentiate each ally. Gifts, on the other hand, give a 1d bonus to the player hero or band on relevant roles. This represents that specific ally gaining focus in the story. However, if the roll results in an eye, that gift is wasted and cannot be used again until a fellowship phase. For my first ally, I am picturing a very old dwarf who has seen much of the shadow and who has retreated into himself a bit. I will name him Anar and give him the gift, such as it is, of Shadow Touched, and the quirk that he only speaks coastal. As you can see on these cards, allies can gain the Hardened status and Kingly gifts. During a fellowship phase, you may select one ally to award the Hardened status, which will improve your band's readiness. Hardened allies can also be given Kingly gifts, which represent the player hero giving them marvelous artifacts, wondrous items, or famous weapons and armor that have been found during the adventuring phase. Mechanically, a Kingly gift works like a regular gift, however, it also allows you to reroll one feat die with the result of an eye that would cause a normal gift to be wasted. Anyways, once your six initial allies have been created, you are ready to plan a mission. The first step to take when planning a mission is to set the mission objective. There are some random examples you can roll for, or you can come up with your own. I'm going to go with Reclaim an Important Landmark. Next, choose which allies you will bring with you. For this mission, I will bring all six of my newly created allies. However, depending on the nature of the mission, as well as any lingering negative conditions that allies might have, you might choose to leave some behind in a safe haven. If you bring an ally with a condition along, make sure to mark that down on your mission sheet. If any of your allies have the hardened status, this can improve your readiness score. For your first mission, this normally won't apply. For this example, I've included one hardened ally so the band's readiness score goes from 4 to 5. This also drops the readiness TN to 15. Now we'll set the band's composition and modify any dispositions accordingly. My band will be medium sized, so no change there. However, we are geared for war, with a specialization of stalwarts, so I will improve my war and rally dispositions by one each, and make a note of the heavy burden. The specializations don't seem to have any requirements that you need in order to choose them. The final thing to do before my mission is to set the hunt threshold. Moria is considered a dark land, so the base threshold starts at 14. This number could be modified by the outcome of previous missions and the duration of your last fellowship phase. The base eye awareness starts at 0, however, my player hero is a dwarf, so it goes up to 1. And then, I am traveling with a medium band, so the eye awareness will start at 3. Now you and your band are ready to brave the long dark of Moria. Throughout your journeys, your band is going to face dangers. Often when this happens, you'll have to make an endurance test. To make an endurance test, make a rally roll against your readiness TN, plus the might of the enemy, or if the damage is coming from something like a cave-in or a fall, pick a modifier from the damage threat table on page 203. If the roll succeeds, no harm done. If the roll fails, however, one or more members of the band will suffer an injury. If an ally has no injuries, then they suffer a fleeting injury. If the ally is already injured, then worsen the severity by one rank. 
If the endurance test failed with an I, you must either roll on the injury severity table to randomly determine how bad it is, or apply an injury condition to two allies. Any allies with a grievous injury are dying. If they are not healed with a healing or expertise roll soon, or if they gain another injury, they die. Whenever an ally suffers a severe or grievous injury, you and your band also gain one point of shadow from dread. If an ally is killed, lost, or left behind, then you will gain two shadow points. Once the enemy is encountered, it's time for a battle. First determine if there is an extra objective. This could be forcing your way through a guarded door, rescuing a prisoner, holding a bridge, or retreating. If the battle is in a fairly open space and the only goal is to defeat all the enemies, there's no need to include an objective. Similar to skill endeavors, battle objectives are given a resistance depending on the level of the challenge. From a 3 for a simple challenge all the way up to a 12 for an overwhelming task. The rules for enemies have been simplified here so that you can play out large scale battles. Instead of the usual stats for individual enemy types, you will now encounter war parties which only have two scores, might and resistance. Might represents the overall strength of the war party, while resistance represents the number of enemies encountered. War parties might also come with an arch foe. These are powerful enemies, such as an orc chieftain or a troll. An arch foe can raise the war party's might and resistance, as well as impose a loss of 1d on your band's clash rolls. The arch foe remains with the enemy group until the end of battle, unless your player hero faces him in single combat, which I'll cover in a bit. For this example battle, I'll say my band comes up against a pack, with one lesser arch foe. This means my enemy has a might of 1 and a resistance of 7. As I mentioned earlier, battle doesn't need to have any more objectives than to defeat the enemy. However, big empty spaces are boring, so let's add a big chasm with a bridge that has to be crossed. This will be a simple objective with a resistance of 3. I will be unable to apply any clash successes against the enemy until the resistance of the objective is met. As well, let's say the orcs have some improvised barricades that will cause a complication. Now that the stage is set, it's time to fight. If neither side has an immediate advantage, such as having successfully ambushed the other, then the first thing to do is for your player hero to make a battle roll as they give initial commands to your allies. Your band will gain an advantage or a complication to clash rolls depending on if the roll succeeded or not. My character has a pretty excellent battle rating of 3, and the skill is favored. The roll is a success. This means I can gain 1d on my first clash roll. Not only that, but the roll resulted in a g rune, which means the advantage persists until a complication would remove it. If the roll had have failed, I would lose 1d for the first round, or more if the roll failed with an I. Next, you can choose an action for your player hero to take in the first round of battle. This is called your leader focus, and you can command, inspire, fight, or duel. Command has the chance for your band to gain dice and clash rolls, inspire can grant inspiration, or the strength to ignore some negative conditions. Fights let you make a regular weapon attack against the enemy to lessen the resistance, and potentially gain a bonus on the next clash roll. And finally, duel lets you battle one-on-one -on -one against an arch foe. All of these options can certainly improve your band's chances. However, failing these rolls will negatively impact your band or your player hero. For this example, I'll choose Command as my leader focus, which lets me make another battle roll. A successful roll will give my band one extra dice on the coming clash roll. Now it's time for your band to get into position. Pick one of the following stances, aggressive, balanced, guarded, or fleeing. Like stances in the regular rules, there are pros and cons to each stance. For this first round, my band will be in the aggressive stance. This means that my roll is ill-favored, but I can immediately reduce the resistance of the objective by one. Once your band is in position, the clash begins. Make a war roll against your readiness TN, plus the might of the enemy, war party. Remember to gain or lose any dice from previous effects, such as an arch foe, advantages and complications, or your leader focus. You can also use an ally's gift here. This will give your roll an advantage, but also put that ally in danger should the clash go poorly. For this first clash, I will call on my ally, Veg, and use his indomitable gift to give the roll one extra die. I make the roll ill-favored because of my band's aggressive stance. Then, my band's default war score is 2. However, they're geared for war, so it becomes a 3. My initial battle roll was a success, as was my leader focus, so I can add another d6 for each of those, and one more from using an ally's gift. However, I will lose 1d because of the presence of the arch foe, and lose another d6 because of the complication from the orc's barricade. So, to tally all that up, I can roll two feet dice, only taking the lower result, with four success dice. These dice have to equal or beat a 16, which is my readiness TN of 15 plus 1 for the might of the enemy. What a success! Even with the feet die result of an I, the d6s easily beat a 16. As well, I rolled two sixes. That means I have three success points in total, one for the successful roll and two extras for the two success icons. Any successes can be spent on the clash success table. Remember that before I fully attack the enemy, I need to overcome the obstacle of the bridge. Luckily, the bridge only has two points of resistance left. I'll spend two successes to defeat the objective. Now I can actually engage the enemy, and I will spend my final success to reduce their resistance by one. This roll is not all good news, however. 
The feet die is an eye, and I used an ally's gift on this roll. So even though the roll was a success, the eye means that the gift is now wasted, and I cannot benefit from it again until after a fellowship phase. If my clash roll had failed, then I would have had to make an endurance test for the band. If the clash roll failed with an eye, then I would also roll on the clash setback table. This table features some really horrible things that you don't want to have happen. So remember, there's no rolling for your band and your enemy separately in clashes. One roll will either be a success for you or for your enemy. The only time you'll have to roll for the enemy is during a duel. If you chose duel as your leader focus, your hero will face an arch foe in combat. This is resolved using the regular rules for combat with one change. Your allies can help you in a duel. To represent this, successes gained during the clash roll can be used to add dice to your player hero's roll or deal more damage. While your hero and arch foe are fighting, the rest of the battle is still raging. To switch between the larger battle and the duel, run three close quarter combat rounds in between every clash. Once all these steps are taken, you can start the next clash by repeating the steps starting with selecting your leader focus. The battle will continue until your band is defeated or you reduce the enemy's resistance to zero, effectively killing them or causing them to flee. Remember, if the battle is ever too much for your band, you can also attempt to flee by making that your battle objective and setting your band's stance to fleeing. It's also possible for an ally to make a desperate stand. If a role for the band or player hero fails at a critical moment, an ally can step in to hopefully save the day. First, choose which ally steps into the fray, then repeat the failed role. However, this time, the role is favored and inspired. If the new role results in a G-Rune, the role succeeds and the ally survives against all odds. Otherwise, whether the role succeeds or fails, the chosen ally is lost. That's all for now. Hopefully you find this helpful with running the Moria solo mode. I will fully admit that I found this system quite complicated, but making this video has helped me wrap my head around it a bit better. Up next on this channel will be a review of the Alien the Role Playing starter set, so stay tuned for that. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.